talked about conservative measures, therapy, uh, anti-inflammatories, bracing, uh, can be uh, helpful for mild uh, instability. Uh, surgery options, we call this MPFL, medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, is uh, often necessary for recurrent dislocations or, or uh, instability. And that basically is um, reconstructing this disrupted ligament on the, the medial side, <coughs> the inner side of the ligament, and bringing that into proper alignment. Uh, that can be, we usually will take a, a graft, a hamstring from the patient, from their, their insertion of the hamstring, use one of the hamstring tendons to loop and, and drill holes into the knee, you know, the patella, as well as the thigh bone. Uh, and that creates an anatomic Rain, like the reins of a horse, basically holding that patella in position through that range of motion. So a very uh, helpful and successful surgery. Um, next problem, we'll let Brett talk a little more about later, but in general, we see this quite a bit, this chondromalacia, this term you'll hear a lot today, this softening of the cartilage, a de degenerative process where it begins to shear or delaminate or flake. Sometimes you'll see flakes in, this, in the joint. Uh, this is more common age. You'd see the 40s to 50s and 60 year olds with a, a swelling, no real injury, just swelling and, and crepitus, as, as Brett mentioned. Uh, sometimes you'll have some mechanical <coughs> symptoms where there's a flap that's large enough to catch a lot. Uh, real common behind the patella. Uh, so we'll see a lot of anterior knee pain uh, with people who've done repetitive squatting or jumping over the years. Uh, this often is treated conservatively, so we try, uh, there's, there's some limited short-term relief from some arthroscopy treatments of this. Uh, you'll see in this picture there's sh uh, that shaggy appearance behind the kneecap is what we call chondromalacia of the patella. And there is some limited short-term benefit from going in and, and giving this a haircut, so to speak, and trimming that down to a stable, firm surface. Um, you can sometimes see the, the hyaline cartilage on the on the bones is sort of like the layers of an onion. You'll see uh, a layer that's peeled. We can remove that layer and get down to a real nice firm surface, and that may provide some uh, short-term relief. It, it doesn't stop the process, and this is, uh, to me, on the spectrum of arthritis, chondromalacia is this early spectrum. And so the natural history is it's gonna progress <coughs> to a deeper level at some point. So, but there can be some uh, relief of some of the mechanical symptoms uh, short term. Uh, this is often what you would see on x-rays, not a lot of impressive findings you might notice on the x-ray on your right. There may be some early uh, spurring on the, on the kneecap uh, as you look from a side view, but otherwise pretty, pretty normal x-rays. Uh, although in this MRI, you see this bright signal between the patella and the, the uh, femur or thigh bone. You see this bright signal. That's the articular cartilage that's begun to thin and, and delaminate. And so that's a real common finding in what we would call chondromalacia of the patella in this view of the MRI. Um, obviously, we, we touched on conservative measures. I think this is, we hammer conservative measures uh, quite a bit on this, especially the anterior knee pain or front side of the knee pain. We, we, Try to, try to persevere with that. But often it'll come to a point where those aren't successful and we'll try some arthroscopic procedures where we remove that damaged cartilage um, and try to create a firm surface for weight bearing and also uh, remove any fragments that may be catching um, as well. Okay, and this is of course the, the buzzword that you'll often hear with athletics is the ACL tear. This time of year we hear Every time you turn on ESPN, someone's out for the season, or, or you know, uh, Nick Chubb from Georgia had a major reconstructive surgery and it's obviously returned pretty, pretty well uh, from a year ago. Uh, this would be a, a typical case: 22-year-old uh, male uh, stepped in a hole, twisted his knee, uh, or this may be a football injury. A lot of times, these are non-contact injuries. Uh, Brett showed the slide of the, the basketball player who just planted to box out on the, on the baseline and, and felt a pop. Uh, usually there is that, a lot of times you'll hear the history of I felt a pop or there'll be a uh, giving way in the knee. Uh, many times significant swelling depending on uh, where the ACL is torn. The ACL has an artery within it so that when it tears it bleeds. So that's hence a lot of swelling in the knee. Um, 
often associated with meniscal tears, and so you'll get some tenderness at the joint line. They're also associated with bone bruising uh, on the outer side of your knee. So a lot of times the joint line tenderness is related to bone bruising from this injury and the way that the pivoting and, and extension of the knee occurs. Um, so we call this Lachman test um, is where we test the shear, the, the translation between the, the femur and the tibia. And if there, we grade this based on millimeters of translation. And so oftentimes if we We'll have a, a little laxity in our ligaments. Some people have a grade one laxity, and you test the other knee, it feels symmetric. And so <coughs> some people may have a false sense of looseness in their ACL. But those traumatic injuries, if you catch them before their muscles are spasmed and before they're guarding, they'll have quite significant translation in that Lachman test. Um, this is the, the front ligament, the cruciate ligaments that comes, that's a Latin term. You've heard of crucible, the cross. Uh, that's because these two because these two ligaments cross each other, the anterior uh, is in front of the posterior cruciate ligament, and this is the ligament that we're addressing at this point. Uh, the ligament involves front to back stability, but also there's a real important rotational stability uh, component to the ACL, and often is is not uh, in some of the previous surgical techniques. Um, the front to back stability was addressed, but if you put your graft into vertical, it won't address the rotational stability. So uh, this this surgery has really uh, evolved more the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years uh, with regard to anatomic location of where you put the graft uh, and placement of this in surgery. This is an MRI, and uh, you see on the right, you see what a normal ACL, you see a very taut, dark line uh, that goes diagonally from the back of the femur to the front of the tibia. This is an intact ACL, and then on your left you see really no distinct line. There's blood, all the white, the fluid signal there is, is usually blood, and there's, you can see a portion of the stump of the ligament. But this is a complete ACL tear on the, on the left-hand side. Um, and in the right, you see the contrast with the intact ACL on the, on the right side. So conservative options are, are possible, and, and Brett touched on that. We, we look at patient activity level, age, uh, we look at uh, the symptoms. Uh, there's there's times where you will see someone who has such strong quadriceps and hamstring muscles that they don't have very uh, significant symptoms. There's a lot of people who ski and do things without an ACL who've rehabbed their quadriceps and strengthened uh, to the point where they, they don't have symptoms. So that, that can be an option for uh, middle age or, or older. But we also would, would do an ACL in someone who's symptomatic and, and older if their activity level's high and they're having symptoms. So we don't let age keep us from doing the, the right treatment, but there are sometimes some conservative options. Uh, surgical options, we use a, a graft to reconstruct the ACL. I, I didn't put in here, but should have put in an autograft is tissue from your own body. There's the option of a patella tendon and bone. I didn't put that one in here. Uh, that's a that's something that's used often on some of the contact athletes in college uh, or high school. Uh, sometimes hamstring, this is more just the preference of the surgeon. Uh, hamstring autograft is uh, two of the tendons of the hamstrings which, can, which attach at the front of the tibia. And that's what Brett was mentioning, it's called the PEZ tendons. And those are easily accessible you know, through a small incision so we can harvest those at the time of surgery. And those make a real nice graft. Uh, the, the bone, the tendon bone has been classically used as sort of the gold standard. There's been a transition back and forth between using hamstrings. In the previous days, the fixation methods for hamstrings weren't as good, so that a lot more people did bone patella tendon. We've got better fixation methods, so there's a school of thought either way. Uh, but both make very good grafts, and very strong grafts. There's times where either someone has had a, a there's a revision surgery or there's an adult who's maybe a lower level of activity. There's times where we would use an allograft, which is a donated tendon. Uh, those can be adequate grafts. There is an element of uh, some, of some uh, reaction around the, the graft. These are not very vascular tissues, so there's not a large rejection factor like you would see for a heart transplant or a, a kidney. Those have to be matched specifically. These can be um, frozen specimens, they've been uh, cleansed, bio-cleansed, so there's not very many uh, 
factors that would call, cause an immune response. However, it's still not your tissue. And so sometimes this can create a larger tunnel in the bone by the reaction you have around the graft. Sometimes there's a slight loosening of the graft or lengthening over time. Uh, but they still can be very stable and, and they're obviously less painful surgeries because we don't have to harvest tissue from the patient. So there can be some, some uh, indications to do that for a lesser active person. Uh, so factors, we talked about activity level and age, uh, and those things are taken into consideration. Also symptoms, as there's many that aren't symptomatic from, uh, from those injuries. Uh, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Clayton get more into the total knee arthroplasty. There's some times when this, this case, we'll, we'll stop here because this is more in the total knee range, but we do some arthroscopies for our arthritis occasion with chondromalacia during a, a moderate stage there's some mechanical symptoms. Uh, Brett mentioned that, that going in and cleaning out uh, fragmented cartilage or, or things that meniscal tears that are associated with arthritis. So there are times where we address this through a scope, but in the later stages, obviously, the, the options become more reconstructive and, and related to knee replacement. And so uh, the other cartilage re reconstruction restoration surgery we're going to let Dr. Franklin touch on later, some of the newer technologies and uh, and, uh, transplants and things of that nature. Uh, he's going to cover it in a, a topic a little later. Uh, thank you, and we will sort of we'll save our questions. Is that right? Okay. Thank you a lot. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Ryan Aaron. He is a physiatrist here at Sports Med. Going to be talking about uh, radio frequency ablation of nerves around the knee, non optimal treatment for the arthritis. Good morning. Ryan Aaron, one of the non-surgical physicians here at SportsMed. Um, I'm the only one out of this group that is not from Huntsville. I spent time from uh, growing up in Birmingham and Downbridge. So today I'm going to talk to you about a new method for treating painful knee arthritis. All right, so as we know, arthritis is a, is a painful and disabling condition. It's significantly uh, influence your quality of life. It's a leading cause of disability in older adults. And when we look at the aging of the population and the increase in, increase in prevalence of obesity in our population, we're also seeing an increase in the prevalence of arthritis. Now, the treatments have been discussed. Conservative treatments generally consist of medications, physical therapy, bracing, uh, injections. Uh, for some patients, that's successful. For others, not so. So. Patients with more severe pain may ultimately require surgery. Now, not every patient is going to be a surgical candidate. Okay, not every patient necessarily wants to have surgery. So, an option might be radio frequency ablation. So, with radio frequency ablation, basically what we do: a radio frequency current is applied through an electrode to a targeted nerve. Okay, and this creates heat locally around this nerve in order to put a lesion or burn in it. In order to block the painful signal coming from the nerve. So this technology has been around for a long time. Uh, it's first used in 1965 to treat malignant pain. Uh, then in 1983, physicians started using it to treat painful back conditions. Uh, as, as time has gone by, there's been advances in the equipment, there's been improvement in the imaging that we use uh, to guide this procedure. <coughs> so it's led to a widespread use of radio. Primarily today, it's used for treating painful spinal conditions and neck pain and back pain. But we have a new indication for it, and that's treating knee pain associated with arthritis. So there have been three nerves that have been identified that we can safely access with radio frequency ablation. Okay. We have a nerve here, a nerve here, and a nerve here that we target with this procedure. 
else. So there are two stages to this procedure. The first stage is the diagnostic stage. So in other words, we have to do a test injection or a nerve block on your knee to see if you get pain relief, to see if you're a candidate. You know, basically how this procedure is performed, you know, the patient is lying on the back for the procedure, a pillow is placed underneath the painful affected knee. We use an x-ray to guide needles down to these three nerves I just showed you. And then we deposit an anesthetic or a numbing medicine around these nerves to see if your pain is bad. Now, one thing that will sometimes cause anxiety with patients is, well, you don't get sedation for this, okay? So the reason is, well, if I need to assess you after the procedure and you need to assess yourself and you're asleep on the table, but we're not going to get any information out of you, right? So, so we just can't use sedation. Okay? Now, this procedure can create pain at the injection site, so I'm sticking needles into you, basically. All right? So that can create tissue disruption. It can create bruising. Generally, this is a distinctly different pain than the pain that you live with every day with your knee. So when a patient assesses himself after the diagnostic test, they have to be able to pull that out of the equation. Okay? So they have to be able to separate the pain from the injection from the pain that they have every day. Typically that is not a big issue, uh, but it's just something to think about. Okay, so again here, here are our three nerves that we address with this procedure. This is an x-ray where the needles have been placed. All right, so uh, we've done our test injection and the patient gets great relief. Their, their pain is much better. So now that brings us to the radio frequency ablation procedure, okay? So this is done under sedation, under sedation in an outpatient setting. So setup is basically the same. Uh, the patient's lying on the back, pillows placed underneath the knee. We use x-ray to guide the needles down to these areas. But instead of injecting something through the needles this time, I'm going to insert a a wire or an electrode through this needle that's going to create heat around the nerve, put a lesion in the nerve. Okay. The procedure takes about 30 minutes. Now, a question I, I pretty commonly get is, well, if you burn my nerves, am I going to be weak in my leg? And the answer is no, we're not burning that kind of nerve. We're burning the sensory nerves. We're not burning the motor nerves. So it's not going to leave you weak in your leg. And we do, uh, we, well, we take caution to make sure that we're not near a motor. So a couple of things we do. Well, we're doing this under x-ray. So I see exactly where I need to put the nerve and I stay away from those dangerous areas. You know, number two, we do what's called motor stimulation. So in other words, I send an electrical stimulation through that wire, through that electrode. Uh, and if it's too close to a motor nerve, the muscles in the leg are gonna contract, okay? At which time I would just reposition the nerve. So there are cautions that we take to, to make sure that doesn't happen. So this is just a picture of the, of the kind of room that you have this procedure. Okay, so this is a procedure room. Um, of course, this, this is the table where the patient's placed, lying on the back. This is the C-arm of the x-ray that we use uh, for, for guidance. Uh, this is the monitor that I use while I watch the needles as they're guided down to the knee. All right, so. When we're looking for potential candidates for this procedure, well, it's patients that have painful arthritis of the knee that have gone through the, the typical conservative treatment options. So they've had therapy, they've had braces, they've, they've tried injections, they've tried medicines, and none of this stuff has worked, okay? Patients that are considered inoperable, okay? So maybe you have too many health conditions, you're not a good patient or a good candidate to have surgery. Uh, or maybe you're a little too old to have surgery. You know, another potential candidate. A patient that has persistent pain after knee surgery, also a potential candidate. But ultimately, uh, the candidates are, are chosen by who responds well to the diagnostic injections. Okay? Who has a positive response? Who gets better? So one of the first studies that was published that showed that this procedure is actually helpful uh, for people that have knee arthritis uh, it was just published back in 2011, it was done in Korea. So they took patients with moderate or greater intensity pain uh, for at least three months. They had x-ray evidence of, of, of arthritis, they tried the conservative approaches, uh, none of it really helped much. 
So they did positive test injections on these patients, and they found 17 patients that they put in the ablation group, and they found 18 patients they put in a sham group or placebo group. So what these guys reported was greater improvements in pain, function, and satisfaction for the patients that were treated with the ablation versus the sham. Now they didn't look at any patients that had previous knee surgery, so there's not any information regarding that in this study. They didn't report any adverse events associated with this. So no problems afterwards. Alright, so this is a, a case that was published in the journal, uh, the PMR journal in 2014. Uh, this is a 48-year-old male that injured himself at work. Uh, went through the conservative measures, really had no success, had significant arthritis. Ended up undergoing surgery. A year later, he was still having significant pain. Okay. The surgeon ordered more physical therapy, but it didn't help much, so the surgeon decided to send him uh, to be evaluated for a radio frequency ablation procedure. So he had his diagnostic injections. His pain went from a 9 out of 10 to 0 out of 10 after the diagnostic injections. So 10 is miserable pain, worst imaginable pain. If somebody set you on fire, kind of pain. Okay. Zero is no pain. So he's gone from a nine to a zero after his test. So he underwent the radio frequency ablation procedure. Uh, and then they followed up with this, this patient in two weeks and then three months after the procedure. And his pain was reported zero, zero out of 10. Okay. They started the guy in physical therapy, had some gains in strength, range of motion. He was able to go up and down stairs now uh, without the use of the hand brake. All right, so this is just, uh, just more examples. Uh, these are cases that were recorded from a pain clinic in Italy. They followed nine patients after radio frequency ablation procedure, including three pa patients that had previous knee surgery. Uh, so they followed them for 12 months, and they reported significant pain reduction and improved autonomy in daily life up to 12 months. That's including two of the three patients that had had previous knee surgery. Okay? And they also reported no adverse events. So uh, when we look through the literature, there's, there's not a lot of literature comparing radio frequency ablation to other conservative options. The, the only thing that has been reported is radio frequency ablation versus a knee injection. Um, this was uh, published in, uh, in Turkey, actually. So they had 37 patients that received a, a radio frequency <coughs> ablation had 36 patients that received a knee injection. The injection included a bupivacaine, which is an anesthetic morphine, which is a pain medicine, uh, and betamethasone, which is a steroid. Now, this is not the typical uh, cocktail that, that, that I use, or, or, or uh, most people use. Typically, morphine is not used. Usually, it's some combination of anesthetic uh, and steroid. Uh, but nonetheless, they reported a greater reduction in pain and function at one month and in three months in the RFA group versus the injection group. Uh, so this is another case. So 81 year old female, she has pain in both knees. She tried all the conservative treatment approaches, temporary relief. She had decreased tolerance for, for uh, weight bearing. She had to ambulate with a cane. She was offered surgery, but she declined. She was scared to have surgery. So she decided to undergo bilateral genicular nerve ablation, radio frequency ablation of the knee. So her pre-procedure pain, her pain before the procedure was reported at 8 out of 10. Okay. So after the procedure, they followed up with her at 6 weeks and 3 months after the procedure, her pain was 0 out of 10. Now, prior to the procedure, she could walk 10 feet with a cane, and then she had to stop. Okay. She was hurting too badly, she couldn't walk any further. After the procedure, she was able to walk up to five blocks with no assistive device with minimal discomfort. All right, things to consider. This is not a permanent solution. These nerves grow back and regenerate. You know, typically, you're looking at somewhere around the line of <coughs> six to 18 months, okay? So when these nerves start to regenerate, your pain starts to come back, okay? It's not 100% guarantee it's gonna work. So a couple of things you have to think about. You know, while the nerves have been uh, carefully studied as to which nerves we need to approach, and this has been done through, through cadaver studies, and these are the nerves that we can safely access. There are other nerves that go to the knee joint that we cannot access, okay? In addition, there can be variability in where these nerves run, okay? So 
we place the needles, the electrodes, based off the probability where the nerves are going to be. Okay, so just because you have inflation, there's not 100% guarantee that it's going to make the knee feel better. Okay. Success rates, generally what the literature shows, it's about a 60 to 80% success, success rate with a 50% to 100% reduction in your pain. Okay. So you, before I do a procedure on patients, typically one of the questions I get asked is my insurance going to cover this? Well, currently in the state of Alabama, only Medicare covers this. Blue Cross Blue Shield the other insurance plans do not cover this. Um, the reason being is this is a fairly new application for this technology that's been around for a long time. So as more physicians do this, as more data is published, I, I think probably other insurance carriers will pick this up. Uh, but for right now, it's, it's just bad. All right, so potential complications with this procedure. Well, pain at the procedure site. So well, when you stick a needle into somebody, you disrupt tissue, can cause some bruising. That typically resolves in a few days. Okay? Numbness, tingling, burning around the procedure site. You know, we experience these, these nerve symptoms for a few days or a few weeks after the procedure. That, that's temporary as well. You know, nerve injury is, is commonly listed as a potential complication for this. Uh, and I think this is highly unlikely. There's nothing reported in the literature uh, as far as nerve in injury having occurred. And when I, I talk about nerve injury, I talk about motor nerve injury, okay? And we've talked about the precautions that we take to prevent that. Infection, well, anytime you stick a needle into a patient, you introduce the risk of, of infection. Okay, this is another thing that's, that's highly unlikely. These are sterile needles, and, and we're doing this under sterile conditions. If there's no incision here that the patient has to take care of after the procedure. These little, these little injector sites, uh, you can't even see them after a day or two. So uh, I've done thousands of, of injections on proced and procedures on patients. I've never had anybody have an infection. So this is, this is highly unlikely. No fatalities have ever been reported with this procedure. Primarily, the literature reports either post-procedure pain that is temporary or no complications at all. So future use uses. Okay, so from what I understand, there is a study that's being conducted currently at the Andrews Institute where they are looking at performing this procedure on patients prior to having a replacement. Okay. Um, the implications for this are pretty huge. So, you know, potentially you're looking at reducing medications, you know, addictive pain pills, anti-inflammatories that have uh, problems with them after, after surgery. So if this, this pans out and they get some good data, this could be, uh, this would be pretty nice use for this. Okay, and that's all I have. Y'all have I think we're gonna, thank you. We're running a little bit behind, so we're going to switch up the order a little bit, uh, kind of take about a 15-minute break, uh, then we'll come back and uh, have Tommy give us a little talk about some physical therapy things. So.